Well, I hope you've had a, a great day today. I've had a great day. I have loved connecting with so many of you and just some rich, deep conversations. And uh, just reminds me once again why I love being back here at Gordon. And well, this morning, as you may remember, we began to look at the four battles that college students face and what can we do to combat those? And we looked this morning at what does it mean to fight appropriately this battle over our identity? And tonight I want us to look at what does it look like for us to fight against cynicism? And I shared the verse that Paul talked about in Ephesians 6 where he said our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. You know, I have the privilege of working with a lot of different leaders from a lot of different backgrounds and sectors across the country. Um, And a lot of them are very deeply honest with me about their inner world. And there's one leader who has battled cynicism in his own life for years. In fact, he still does. And there's a one two-year stretch where this ministry leader battled the following internal soundtracks on a daily basis. Nobody will change. Uh, What you're doing won't make a difference. And you're wasting your time because ultimately it doesn't matter. And nobody knew that this leader was struggling. Nobody knew because externally everything seemed fine for him. Nobody knew. But for two years, that cynical spirit weighed him down and it was suffocating on his soul. And that leader was me. Cynicism is so tempting in our culture today. You know, I'm sure in your classes in high school and here at Gordon as well, that we learn a lot of different isms, right? Have you noticed this? Right? World religions, you learn about Hinduism and Buddhism and Taoism and Judaism, right? In philosophy, you learn about secularism or postmodernism. In economics and and politics, you learn about capitalism, Marxism, communism, fascism. But I've never heard anybody address the ism of cynicism. Never. And this is something that we've got to talk about because this is a battle that we've got to face. Cynicism, as you probably know, is everywhere. And we need to address it. And I don't think we have any idea how much it has gripped our culture. We don't realize how subtle and how toxic it is for our relationships and for our own soul. And we live in this age of distrust, right? In the age of misinformation and disinformation and AI-generated and distorted images and endless bots. We breathe the air of this cynical culture so much we don't even realize that we're breathing it in our lungs every day. Maybe you've noticed, too, that cynicism is actually celebrated in our culture. Right? Memes and YouTube videos are propped up simply on the basis, the foundation of cynicism. And we can easily grow cynical of institutions and leaders and social media influencers who are just a little too polished in their press releases, a little too charismatic or charming, and a little too perfect with their Instagram filters. It's the dominant spirit of our age. It is the dominant spirit of our age. In fact, if you think about it, secularism is actually a cynical view of reality. So let's back up a little bit and let's, let's define it. What is cynicism? Well, I would define it this way. Cynicism is best defined as mistrusting or distrusting the intentions of other people. And sometimes that actually includes God. It's the belief that everyone is in it for their own self-interest. And therefore, we must mistrust and distrust those people's intentions. That's cynicism. It's, it's the belief that there's always an ulterior motive that someone has. And on top of the fact that I know you have an ulterior motive, is that I know best. I know. You don't know. I know. That's the core of cynicism. That I'm knowledgeable enough to know what's really going on and you don't. Cynicism is a long series of disappointments and unmet desires that generate expectations. The more disappointed you are over a period of time and unmet expectations, the more cynical, more tempted we are to become cynical. 
Jace O'Neill said this, Cynicism is when a small mind and a hurt heart rejects the hope, love, and truth of a big and caring God. Let me say that again. Cynicism is when a small mind and a hurt heart rejects the hope, love, and truth of a big and caring God. Every time I teach on cynicism, this is what happens at this stage when I talk. You can hear a pin drop. And my guess is, it's because there's a whole bunch you're thinking about in your head and your heart right now. And doing a self-inventory, which I think is good. I'm doing it too. So here's the thing. Cynicism usually involves three things. Hopelessness, helplessness, and bitterness, which often comes off as smugness. Hopelessness, helplessness, and bitterness, which often comes across as smugness. And we have the general sense of this is how it's going to be from now on. Ironically, I think the ones who are most insightful and prophetic about cynicism are not philosophers and not theologians and not psychiatrists. They're comedians. You notice that? In fact, the more cynical they are and the sharper they are in their cynicism, the more hilarious and the more popular they are on social media. Here's George Carlin, a late, great comedian. He said, inside every cynical person is a disappointed idealist. And then Stephen Colbert. He said, cynicism masquerades as wisdom. But it is the farthest thing from it because cynics don't learn anything. Because cynicism is a self-imposed blindness, a rejection of the world because we're afraid it will hurt us or disappoint us. And then he said this, Be a fool. Believe things will be good. Now that's not hilarious. That's insightful. That's brilliant. That's profound. Now, it's important that I want to clarify something here because some people say, well, what about skepticism? Are they similar? Are they different? They're different. In fact, I would say that we need to have a healthy sense of skepticism while fighting against the battle of cynicism in our souls. Skepticism says, Hmm, I'm not so sure. There's an uncertainty and an open-mindedness. I'm not so sure, but I may be wrong, but I, I don't know. Skept- or cynicism says, uh, I know, and there's an ulterior motive. And so there's a closed-mindedness to our cynicism. So how do we get to this place where cynicism is so prevalent? What is this? How do we get here? Well, culturally, there are some factors that have existed that allowed us to get to this point. You know, it's a move from a trust in God to a trust in ourselves. That's secularism. But when we are let down by people or ourselves, then we grow to cynicism. So it's moving from trusting God to trusting ourselves to then we let ourselves down and other people let us down, and then we become cynical. Maybe you've noticed that pattern in other people or maybe even in yourself. By the way, social media is a petri dish for cynicism. It just grows exponentially. There's a book by Tyler Staten, and maybe you've read it. It's called Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools. It's a fantastic book. And in it, he says this. It's a little bit of a block quote, so I'll read it slowly, but it's on the screen here. He said, the great social sin of the modern world is naivete. Belief is out. Cynicism is in. Where did that modern phenomenon come from? The balloon was popped on the optimism of human progress, leading to an equally widespread sweep of disillusionment. You and I have been groomed by a post-enlightenment story of deconstruction that doesn't trust God anymore and has plenty of reasons not to trust people either. The result is multiple generations of people who find safety in pretending they don't need, either, don't need either one. And I can trust myself, guide myself, and be enough for myself. And then he said this, Jesus once wisely said that we'll know a tree by its fruit. So what's the fruit of that story of self-sufficiency in the life of a modern person? We're overwhelmed. Everyone I meet is drowning in their thing. It doesn't matter if your thing is an artistic endeavor, profit margins, whining and dining clients, or raising children. We can't get past 
or see past our thing because our thing, whatever it happens to be, is all-consuming. We've avoided becoming naive, but we've done it at the cost of really just swapping jail cells. And maybe for you, you can identify with what Tyler is saying here. But culturally, it's just, it's in the air because we've made this progression. But how do we get here personally? Here's what happens. When we become so disappointed, we need some relief. And you know what we do? We put numbing agent on it. And cynicism is a numbing agent that occurs when overconfidence in our perspective meets our experiences of disappointment and discouragement. And it meets a loss of trust and a loss of hope and a pinch of what's called acedia thrown in. We're going to talk about acedia later this week. It's an important word. And I've found that cynicism strikes an alarmingly forceful blow on the minds and the hearts and the souls of two groups of people, pr- pr- predominantly. Middle-aged men and college students. I'm still trying to understand why those two groups, but middle-aged men and college students. Now, I want to do a little bit of a, a, a unique thing. You're thinking, this is Spiritual Emphasis Week. Why are we learning about the history of this? But I, just stay with me here, okay? Don't, don't go cynical on me just yet, okay? Just stay with me. But cynicism has a very different meaning now than it did when it first started. There was actually a school of cynicism. (laughs) It's kind of weird to think about. But it was started by a student of Aristotle in the 4th century BC. And it was a school of philosophy in ancient Greece that explored important questions about human nature, customs, culture, why we do things, happiness, shame. So it sounded really good. But Cynics, they opposed any sort of customs or traditions or laws. They said, who put those in place? Why should we care? Who decided that that was okay? That was the school of cynicism. And the goal was to shock people by questioning the unspoken rules that existed in our society. In fact, cynics believe that the highest form of wisdom is to live according to nature and not any sort of man-made rules or customs. In fact, the word cynicism actually means dog-like. That's what the root word of cynicism means. It means dog-like in Greek because others say that the behavior and thoughts of people who are cynics were like dogs. The most famous cynic in ancient Greece was a guy by the name of Diogenes. Diogenes. Here's Diogenes. He was one eccentric dude. I'd call him a little crazy. He found this large uh, clay jar, and he actually decided to live in it the rest of his life. (laughs) He lived in a clay jar. But that was the least, that was the most tame thing that he did. He would often urinate on people he didn't like. And then he would defecate in public, sometimes in the theater, in the middle of a performance. And everyone said, what are you doing? This is crazy. And he just took it as affirmation that he was living into this philosophy of cynicism well. Kind of crazy. He was nicknamed Diogenes the dog because he actually saw it as a compliment when people called him the dog. Now, linguists believe the word cynical began to evolve into its current meaning about the 18th century. The rejection of conventional values or or social norms, and over time it changed to mean an attitude of jaded negativity. But if I can be direct and crass for just a moment, can we not agree that a cynical person is someone that they think they have it all right and everyone else thinks they have it all wrong? That they defecate all over your joy and excitement to prove the point and to mock the good things in your life? Isn't that what a cynic does? Someone who urinates on people by assuming the worst in them metaphorically? They're dog-like. When I'm cynical, I act dog-like. And this is what we have to battle. This is what we have to push against. And what makes cynicism so insidious and dangerous for our own souls is that it doesn't come and like wham you on top of the head. It leaks slowly. It's like carbon monoxide. It largely goes undetected. Until you breathe it enough, and then you die. It's not immediate. 
But if it goes unchecked, it can overtake your system entirely. It's like a leaky roof. You can live with a leaky roof for a little bit, but if you ignore it, it's only going to get worse. Or maybe better, it's like a boa constrictor. It just slowly wraps around you, and with every exhale, it just squeezes a little bit tighter. And every exhale, it just squeezes you down until you have no spiritual breath left. That's what cynicism does. And it's a form of protectionism and numbing against further disappointment. But the problem is, it numbs the whole soul. That's why it's so insidious. It kills joy. And it erodes hope. To be cynical is to choose to be distant. Emotionally, relationally, from other people. Maybe you could think of some examples of cynicism in Scripture. There are several, but there are a few that stick out to me. It was present even then. How about Satan's first words recorded in Scripture? By the way, you know, Satan's first words were a question. Not a statement, a question. Right? Asking Adam and Eve, did God really say that? I mean, really? He's trying to plant cynicism. In the heart of Adam and Eve, they go, you know what? Yeah, you're right. Maybe God isn't that good. Or how about Jonah? The whole book is about a cynical dude named Jonah, right? You know what I love about the book of Jonah? It's my favorite Old Testament book. You know why? It's supposed to be what's an, a book of irony. You know why? You ever notice? Everyone and everything in the book of Jonah changes except one dude. Jonah. Everything. The storm changes. The worm changes. The vine changes. The pagan sailors change. The whale changes. Everything. Or the big fish, excuse me. Everything changes. Except Jonah. Why? Because he's so protecting. In his arrogance and stubbornness, he becomes cynical. And when you read the book of Jonah correctly, it goes like this. Jonah, you're an idiot. And by the end we go, whoa. Whoa. I am Jonah. That's only when the book truly has its power in our lives when we go from Jonah, you're an idiot, to whoa, that's me. We cannot honor God if we're cynical people. You know, a lot of the Old Testament prophets struggled struggled with cynicism as well. A lot of them. And I told you I come from Philadelphia. And, uh, and I love Philadelphia, but there's something called the Philly Shrug. And it goes like this, ah, whatever. And that sounds cool, but you know what it is? That's cynicism. Ah, whatever. Philadelphia sports fans know, oh yeah, yeah man, we're just going to lose. It's just a matter of time. But everything, ah, whatever. Ah, oh, there's looting, ah, whatever. Yeah. It's, it's Philly. What do you expect? Now, I don't know what cynicism sounds like to you in your life, in your head, in your soul, but here are some common things of what it sounds like in my world as I interact with others. And some of this is from me too. It sounds like this. Mmm, like that'll make a difference. Mmm, must be nice. Oh, really? Let's see how that turns out. Uh, Yeah, I doubt that. And with a nice little smirk, really. Ah, that's cute. And a little more subtle, oh, wow. Leonard Sweet said that we should avoid friends who respond to things we're excited about with, wow, must be nice. You ever tell a story of someone, something you're excited about, a fun weekend you had, a fun experience you had, and say, wow, it must be nice. How does it come out in your own life? I'm not going to ask you to share out loud, but I want you to just take a moment to think, what does that sound like to me? How does it come out with me, in my head or out of my mouth? It could be in your dorm room, among your friends, your roommate, as you think about class 
those in authority, institutions. It could be the church. It could be Gordon. It could be your relationships or faith or prayer. Students, this is a battle that we must face. And it's crucial that we guard our hearts against this sinister and subtle impact that cynicism can have on us. So, here's what I want to submit to you. This morning we talked about the ways in which we change, right? How we think in terms of our narratives. How we interact with others, right? And also how we practice the spiritual disciplines, the soul training that's needed all while we submit to the role of the Holy Spirit. By the way, when you're cynical, you cannot fully submit to the Holy Spirit. But here are some healthy biblical tensions that we've got to hold. I'm not going to give you like, do these seven things, add water and stir, and you'll have a cynical free life. It's not that easy. But I want to encourage you, we've got to hold some healthy tensions. I don't mean like tension like fighting, but like rubber band tension. Okay? And here are the healthy tensions. The first one is Jesus talks about we need to be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. What does that mean? What does that mean? Now shrewd, sometimes it gets a bad rap in our culture. right? Sometimes we think culturally shrewd means oh, try to leverage yourself and, and be deceitful and, and, and just take advantage of every situation. right? We sort of use that rude, shrewd, word shrewd that way. That's not really what shrewd means. Shrewd means leveraging at the right time, at the right place, and then ultimately when we do it innocently as doves, for the right reason. Dallas Willard said that snakes are shrewd because they, they kind of coil and they're ready to pounce. They never pounce too early, but they never pounce too late. They always know when to pounce. That's being shrewd. Okay? By the way, if you do it innocently... Right? We know a lot of people who are naive and overly innocent. They're all doves and no snakes. And we've been around people overcome by cynicism and deceit, and they're all snakes and they're no doves. And Jesus said we've got to find that balance of double majoring in being serpents and in doves. We've got to be both. Because if all we do is just think about all the, the good things, the hope, right? And, and we, don't, we don't anchor it in reality. Those people are what we call out of touch. And people that are so involved in reality and don't have any hope, we call those people Philadelphians, right? And, and so we've got to find that healthy balance in this. Here's another one. Be childlike, but don't be childish. Be childlike, Right? In Matthew 18, Jesus says this, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them, and he said, Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Not occasionally, or you might make it in, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Fascinating. Jesus says, be like a child. He said, don't, don't be childish. I want you to grow up into maturity. But be like a child. Be like a child. By the way, interestingly, I have never met a little child that was cynical. Have you? It's really hard to be a little child and to be cynical. He wants us to grow up into maturity. He wants us to have the heart of a child, to wonder, to ask for help, to dream and hope, to experience joy easily and publicly. Let me say that again. To experience joy easily and publicly. And to not take ourselves too seriously, to laugh easily and to cry easily. But Paul Miller in his book, A Praying Life, he says this, cynicism is the air we breathe, and it is suffocating our hearts. Unless we become disciples of Jesus, this present evil age will first deaden and then destroy our prayer lives, not to mention our souls. Our only hope is to follow Jesus 
as he leads us out of cynicism. If we're following Jesus, we won't stay in our cynicism. And, I, and this is when I read this, it pierced me because when I was in those two years of struggling with my own cynicism is probably the driest my prayer life has ever been. And it was at that moment I realized, no wonder. Because we're supposed to pray like little children, right? Needy, open, honest before God like a little child. And I'm going, God will never do that. That will never change. That will never happen. Why pray? No wonder it was dry. No wonder God felt distant. So what is the anecdote to cynicism? What do we do if we're experiencing this cynicism? All right? Well, the first one is Paul says, and I love this, in 1 Corinthians 13, that 1 Corinthians 13 passage, this phrase, he says, love always hopes and it always trusts. You can't be cynical if you believe that always ho- love always hopes and always trusts. In Hebrews chapter 12, the writer said, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and to defile many. Cynicism is a bitter root. It is a bitter root that grows up. Now think about Galatians 5, right? You probably had VBS or uh, Sunday school as a kid. You know this, Galatians 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. By the way, I don't see sarcasm on that list. And yet, it's so prevalent and so rewarded that sometimes we forget that sarcasm is not on the list of the fruit of the Spirit. And in Proverbs chapter 4, I love what the the writer of Proverbs talks about. We know this famous verse. Guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. But I want to read around that. We often quote that, but I want to read around it as it relates to cynicism. This is what it says in Proverbs chapter 4. Starting in verse 20. It says, My son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to a person's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet and take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. Talk about very practical ways that we can steer clear of cynicism. Again, this morning we talked about how we change. We change and we examine how we think, how we practice, and how we interact with others while submitting to the Holy Spirit. Here's what I want to do. In just a minute, I'm going to put up a slide, not yet, but in just a minute I'm going to put up a slide And I don't want you to be overwhelmed by this list. But I want to just grease the skids to help you think about ways that you can cut out this bitter root of cynicism if that's in your life. right? But as we put this list up, here's what I'm not asking you to do. I'm not asking you to do all ten of these tonight. (laughs) You're going to be overwhelmed. In fact, you try to do all ten, try to implement this immediately, you're probably going to set yourself up for failure. But I'm going to put them up and I'm going to explain these and then I want to challenge you to sit with this for a moment to say what is the one practice that I can engage in, that I can submit to the Holy Spirit when it comes to cynicism. All right. So let's put this slide up there. Here are some formational practices that we can guard against and do battle with. And if you want to take a picture of it, you can. That's fine. Um, But I'm going to explain each one. Here are ways, and some of these are very personal for me, that I have had to use. Wow, I've got like lots of cameras pointed at me. I'm going to step out of the way, let you guys take a picture. All right? Again, don't do all of them. Don't try all of these. But I want to encourage you to begin to think through what's one, maybe two that you can engage in. And maybe pull in a roommate or a friend or someone you know down the hall that you can practice this with. 
Here's what I've found. When I am struggling with cynicism, the most important thing I do, the best thing I can do to to lance the boil of cynicism off of my soul is to engage in confession and forgiveness. To simply say, this is wrong. Cynicism is a form of pride. Cynicism is cutting me off from others. And Lord, maybe it's even cutting me off from you. And I can't love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself if I'm cynical. And so Lord, I confess that. Just to name that. To name that. It's the best thing you can do to battle against cynicism. The worst thing to do is say, ah, that's not me. I, I don't struggle with it. It's not that big a deal. The best thing you can do is to address it, number one. Number two is to cultivate, uh, cultivating and expressing gratitude. Man, gratitude and cynicism, man, they have a hard time coexisting together. A lot of people who may not know me super well are a bit surprised to hear this, but gratitude does not come naturally for me. And because of that, I've got to work hard at this. I was explaining with a group of students today when they said, what is your, what is your morning, what is your, what is your time with the Lord look like? So I, I do a gratitude journal. I know a lot of people do that. It's very popular. But I don't just r- list five things I'm grateful for. I put the word gratitude at the top and the date. I did it this morning when I woke up. And I write, number one, God I am grateful for, dot, dot, dot. Number two, God I am grateful for, dot, dot, dot. Number three, God I am grateful for. The reason is I want to turn that gratitude into a prayer. It's the first thing I do when I grab my coffee and sit down is just go straight to gratitude. Because gratitude and cynicism have a hard time living together. To be open and surprised by joy and delight. I'm also not someone who naturally is joyful. And so there are days I just wake up and go, I got no joy, God. I got nothing. I'm not discouraged or overwhelmed. I just, joy doesn't come naturally to me. So I say, I'm open. One of my favorite prayers is this. Holy Spirit, surprise me. Surprise me. And you know what? Holy Spirit loves answering that prayer. You know what the Holy Spirit is terrible at? The status quo. The Holy Spirit is terrible at going through the motions, which I love. So the best thing I can do in that submitting to the Holy Spirit to see that battle be combated of cynicism in my heart is to be able to say, surprise me. I'm open, God. Surprise me. Bring it. You can almost dare God because he loves bringing surprise in our lives. Number four, engaging regularly in the spiritual practice of celebration. My guess is you probably haven't put that phrase together, the spiritual practice of celebration. But do you realize that is going to be the posture of heaven? You read Luke 15, the three stories that Jesus tells, it is all marked by something lost, something found, marked by celebrating with other people. I love it. I I remember preaching one time uh, at a community center in Easton, PA, kind of the northeast uh, part of Pennsylvania. A friend of mine, he was planting a church in this community center, and I get up to preach and I look up, and there's a disco ball like right above me. And I'm like, now this is a cool church. In fact, my kids were little at that point, and they, they, they went with me, and then later like, Dad, when are we going back to the disco ball church? Here's the thing. Every church should have a disco ball above it. Yeah. Yes, sir, David. You better believe it. Because there's a spunky saint by the name of St. Teresa of Avila. She's my favorite saint if I had to pick one. She's amazing. Amazing. So spunky. And she said, Lord God, save us from gloomy saints. Now that is a great line. Save us from gloomy saints. Be open to celebration. Even when it feels like you're too old for it, be like a kid. Celebrate like a kid would. It's amazing what can happen to our souls. Number five, giving people the benefit of the doubt. It's so easy to write that and to say that. But of going, instead of just judging the attitudes and, and assuming things about people, to go, you know what, I'm just, I'm just going to give them the benefit of the doubt and assume they meant well. Instead of assuming the worst, what if I assume the best in the people around me? What might that look like? 
And number six, sometimes I've just got to sit down and just play with kids. And just say, show me your Legos. You know what I say to my kids when they were little? Because I'm so bad at being a kid. I said to my son Carter when he was like six, can you teach me how to play Legos? I don't even know how to do this. It's embarrassing. I, didn't, I was like a sports guy. I didn't really play with like Legos growing up. My six-year-old had to teach me how to play. I know when you're a college student, you don't necessarily get a lot of time around kids. I get it. I get it. But if you're involved in a local church or there's somebody you know or a hall director that's got kids, when it's appropriate, like look for spaces to get literally down to their level and say, teach me. Just teach me how to play. Just be fully enraptured in what they're doing. This is a big one here, number seven. Watch, uh, keeping a prayer journal to record when Jesus answers prayer. When we stop praying is when we stop joining in with God's story. And one of the ways we join in with God's story is so easy to forget what we ask, right? We only remember the things he didn't answer, but how about all the things he has answered? We don't often go back, right? We don't go back like the one leper we don't return like the nine. Where are the other nine? Let's be the kinds of people that when God does something, we go, thank you, God. You surprised me. You did it again. You did it again. All right, let me keep going. Number eight, surrounding ourselves with tender-hearted, hope-filled people. Again, who we interact with, our social environment. Who are the people that we can connect with? You say, you know what? They're just joyful. They're light-hearted. They're not naive. They just are able to live into the kind of life I need, the kind of life I long to live. Surround yourself with those people. And when you find them, just say, hey, I'm not trying to be awkward. I just want you to know when Jared said that, I thought of you. Encourage that person. Say, I just need to, I want to spend more time around you because I want to be influenced by that kind of spirit you have. Number nine, inviting people to pray with this for you and with you. And just say, will you pray for me? I don't even know how to overcome this battle by myself. I'm going to need others. Will you pray into this with me? And then lastly, disrupting our environment. What do I mean by that? Sometimes when we're in our rut, in our routine, the best thing we can do is disrupt our environment or disrupt our rhythm. And sometimes this involves saying yes to something I normally wouldn't say yes to. Being involved in something, you know what? What the heck? Yes, let's go for it. And it just, part of that surprise is sometimes getting out of our own rut that we might be in. You know, in our world that's saturated by cynicism, the most revolutionary thing that we can do is to be a person of immense hope. And these practices can help us do this. I know we're going a little bit long. Here's what I want us to do. I want, you, I want to give you like 45 seconds. And I want you to just prayerfully look at the screen and just say, Jesus, what's one thing you would want me to do that I can just practically move into that next step. It may not even be one of these ten. Maybe it's something else. But I want to give you space to listen to Jesus, who I believe can speak to you and wants to speak to you tonight regarding cynicism. I'll just give you that space now. If anybody had a right to feel cynical with all they went through, it probably was the Apostle Paul. The guy went through a lot. He was disappointed a lot. A lot of hardships. But I want you to hear the reality and the hope that Paul communicates in 2 Corinthians 4. He says this, 
But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but we're not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but we're not destroyed. Because we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So this, then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Do you hear that? Do you hear that balance of reality and of hope? Be people of hope. Engage in one of these practices. Hope is so great. Oh, hope is so great. And as Christians, we hold hope in our hands as a gift from Jesus. It is our responsibility as a follower of Jesus to fight against and to not succumb to the alluring force of the spirit of our age of cynicism. To live with hope and joy and compassion and to believe the best in others. I want to just end, I want to invite you, would you stand with me? I just want to read a quick prayer by Eugene Peterson. And then we'll be done. And then we'll brave the storm tomorrow together. And this is a prayer for joy. Which again, joy is a wonderful way in which we combat cynicism. And this is how he prays. He says, Dear Lord, of all that can rightly be called joy, draw me so close to the source of that joy that it would rub off on me. Help me to live an exuberant life. Full of laughter and song feasting and dancing, the fellowship of good friends, and the joyful anticipation of meeting new ones. Help me to celebrate every gift that comes from your hand. Give me a grateful heart, O Lord, wonderfully, cheerfully, hilariously grateful. And though I may never become a saint, may I ever celebrate like one. I have so much to celebrate, Lord. As I close my eyes to reflect on some of those things, bring a smile to my face. No, correct that. Bring laughter. Amen and amen. I've been told, as God's people, you never dismiss them. You just, you just disperse them. So, Gordon students, you are dispersed. Have a great night.